Thank you, Francois. It's, it's been an outstanding morning already, the teaching of Dr. Keller and the worship and the music's just been uh, fantastic. I think the home run has already been scored just by being here and being together, gathered in the name of Jesus of Nazareth uh, to, uh, to talk about and seek a new city, a new Dallas, a new place where the kingdom of God comes very near for the people that live here. Now, my topic is the gospel and vulnerable children, but I want to suspend the gospel part for just a few minutes. That'll come in a few minutes. And I like to focus on the words vulnerable child, or vulnerable children, because I, I really think it's important before we can really grasp what, uh, uh, what the theme and the message is about, even for Movement Day, is to really be on the same page about what it means to be uh, a vulnerable child. Uh, the World Bank says that a vulnerable child is a child that's under the age of 18 and is at risk uh, of lacking adequate uh, care uh, and protection. Now, all children are vulnerable. I, I understand that naturally, but I'm talking about those that are critically vulnerable. You see, child vulnerability is, a, is like a, a downward spiral. And uh, every time there's a shock to the system, to the child, the spiral, you go down the spiral, and at every level, the, the possibility uh, for more risk and more danger increases at every, every time you go down at every level. Now, if you are a vulnerable child living in Dallas, uh, and I want to sort of uh, zoom in a little bit more to make these unfamiliar and synonymous or anonymous uh, descriptions a little bit more closer to home. So just think of it this way. If you're a vulnerable child in Dallas, you, uh, you're probably living without a father at home. You're probably living in poverty. You're probably living in a high-risk community. You're probably failing in school, and your reading level is very, very low. You're probably experiencing, as a norm, family dysfunction where domestic violence is a normal and regular occurrence. Uh, you're probably experiencing some type of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, or otherwise. And you're probably uh, experiencing some level of neglect people aren't there to care for you for the basic needs that you have. Now in Dallas County, 190,000 children live below the poverty line, which is uh, defined as $22,000 or less annually for a family of four. Now four years ago, that number, or 10 years ago, that number was uh, 20% and now it's 30%. So I'm not a rocket science, but we're trending the wrong direction. DISD reports that 70% of first graders this year uh, are uh, Hispanic and 23% are African American. So just to give you an idea of a demographic uh, description. In 2011, the Center for Public Policy Priorities report that poverty is the most reliable indicator of the future uh, well-being of a child. 28%, which is about 180,000 children, live every day with food insecurity. That means they don't know if they're going to eat more than the one meal they're going to have. And they also live with inadequate nutrition. 70% of public school children uh, are eligible for the free and reduced meals uh, that are offered at school. And 18% um, of Dallas County children have no health insurance. More than 33% live in single parent family homes. And there, are, there is research that's, that documents the correlation between living in a single family home and the challenges that make it more difficult for one to succeed and to thrive. 1,300 teens, uh, children and teens, are, were homeless in 2011, and about 61% of them were African-American children. Over 50% of homeless children uh, in Dallas uh, are under the age of seven. Now think about that. Uh, over 50% of the children that are homeless in our city are under the age seven, of, of seven. So on one of the coldest nights uh, that we will have this year, uh, as we get ready to slip into our warm beds, I hope that this fact comes back to you and keeps you awake. So it's, it's important and it, it's a good conclusion that investing in the poor children of our city is a, a, a great opportunity for return on investment because it not only helps the child, it also impacts their family and then their community. So it, it, it's a great investment. So if I were to tell you about a story of a future Dallas that uh, that you could imagine living in a large metropolitan city, a wealthy city, a commercial hub, uh, a, a city that is uh, seen as a personification of, uh, of excellence, the symbol of global prominence, 
uh, I would also have to ask you to imagine living in that city as uh, a four-year-old African-American or Hispanic Latino boy or girl with no father, one parent maybe, no place to call home, you're homeless, not sure if you'll eat more than once today. Imagine living in this city without health insurance. That Imagine that your future is destined for poverty. Uh, you, ha you will have a hard road mentally, physically, emotionally, socially, and uh, you probably will be neglected and you probably will be abused. And on top of all that, there's no one to protect you. Uh, if you're one of the 2,500 children that are in foster care, you are very, very fortunate because you have a safe place. But you know that deep down inside of you, as you live in this wonderful city with beautiful skyscrapers, that what you really, really want is, is a home, a family, a forever family. So, so I have to tell you that when I, when I look at all this, and this does not sound like Dallas. This sounds like a developing country. I've been to many developing countries, and that's pretty much what you see everywhere. You just would not imagine that this would be Dallas. And when I read and came over across these facts, I thought for a moment, you know, my heart is sad for, for my wife, Belinda, who's here in the audience. For This is the city that we call home. Our, our hearts, my heart kind of sunk. So now that you are sufficiently depressed, discouraged, uncomfortable, and doubtful about our city, um, I want to tell you another story that might uh, breed hope uh, and uh, aspiration in our hearts and our minds. But before I tell you that story, I have a few qualifying questions to help sort of set up uh, the, the stories. I think you're going to like it. I, I love it. So, so um, you know, just a few months ago, we, uh, we commemorated and we honored the, uh, the life uh, and the death of uh, President John F. Kennedy, the assassination of JFK. And so we all know that um, we all are aware, of course, of the greatest fatality in the history of Dallas. It happened just a few blocks from here. And so I know you know about that, but I want to ask you a question. Do you know about the greatest founding in the history of Dallas? I know you know about the fatal car of JFK, but do you know about the founding cabin of RCB? I know you know about Mother Teresa and how she, we admire how she served uh, the dying, but have you analyzed uh, the way Robert Cook Buckner served the living? Founding cabin is just around the corner and I want to sort of take you there. Go with me now in your mind's eye and your imagination is if we were to be able to commission a field trip right now and I'd say let's all get out, we're going to go single file and we're just going to walk a few blocks from here, we're going to go over to Dealey Plaza and just north of Dealey Plaza, you're going to find a place called uh, Pioneer Plaza. And in that Pioneer Plaza, there is a cabin that, uh, that perhaps you've seen before. In fact, I, if I could see you all, I would probably say, raise your hand if you've seen the cabin before, Pioneer Plaza. But you've seen it. You drive right there down uh, past uh, that Pioneer Plaza area. And there's a cabin right in the middle of, uh, of, of that uh, area. Now, after you look at the cabin, if you cross the street, south and you go behind the uh, the red uh, courthouse we call old red courthouse building uh, you're going to find a sign that's sort of like a legend it kind of tells you what's in the plaza on the other side and you're, you'll see uh, what's there and what you'll find is that uh, the sign describes that cabin as the founding cabin of our city did you know that this used to be called pete's corner uh, that was our name until someone decided we would name it uh, on, uh, after the name of the, the, uh, the vice president that ran with President Polk, George Mifflin Dallas. So that's why it, today could be Biden, Texas, if, if we were to do it today, but it was, it was, it was Dallas then. And so, uh, and so that's the cabin that's there. John Lee Bryan, 1841, built the first cabin. It was a cedar cabin that he built right there on the banks of the Trinity, which just a few miles from here. But here's what the sign says. If you go and read the sign behind the red courthouse, this is what it says. Tennessee-born adventurer John Neely Bryan founded a settlement in 1841 known as Dallas. He built a one-room cedar cabin similar to the one which is of the same time period. Now, they're referring to the cabin that's over there on Pioneer Plaza. This cabin, now here's the catch, this cabin was donated by Buckner Orphanage. That's when I say, what, what? This cabin that you see here, similar to the one that John Neely Bryan built in 1841 was donated by Buckner Orphanage. So you have to stand back and say, well, wait a minute, wait. Buckner Orphanage gave the founding cabin 
to the city of Dallas? How, how, how did Buckner Orphanage get the cabin? Well, again, I want to ask you, you know about the fatal car, but do you know about the founding cabin? Similar cabin uh, that's described there on the Pioneer Plaza, I think, and I think I have proven that it, it not is similar, it's not like, it is the cabin. Now, granted, you know, over the years you replace wood and you replace mortar and different things and things get adjusted. And, but in principle, over the years, that is the cabin that John Dewey Bryant built that was given to the city of Dallas by the Butner Orphanage. And so you see that there and kind of wonder how in the world did that happen? How was it donated by Butner Orphanage? Well, um, there, uh, when I did the research, I found out that uh, this, of course, John Lee Bryan cabin uh, had two moves. That over time, when the city developed, the first move was out to White Rock Lake, White Rock Hill exactly, close to where I live. The second move was out further east to the Pinson land, owned by J.T. Pinson. And so it was moved a second time. And what happened is that uh, Robert Cook Butner, who was a pastor also from Tennessee, uh, came to Paris uh, right after, uh, right before the Civil War. He came here and he established uh, a printing press. The printing press was located right uh, at the same intersection of Houston and Elm where the Texas Book Depository is. And so uh, this cabin uh, was, uh, was built there. Then he came, did the printing press right close to the Texas Book Depository. In 1877, the deacons uh, in Paris, uh, Texas came together uh, he called a meeting of deacons, and uh, he opened in 1879 the Buckner Orphans Home, 1879, 135 years ago. By 1880, he came to downtown Dallas, and he took a train on the Pacific Railroad 10 miles out to Syene Switch, where there he met uh, a man by the name of J.T. Pinson, and he asked the man uh, for the 44 acres, how much do you want for the land? And this man, who was expecting him, said $17 an acre. Buckner stuck his hand out there and says, I'll take it. So they shook. And uh, since uh, he purchased the land that day by the, uh, by the shaking of hands and by the word of J.T. Pinson, he went to the cabin that was on the, the land. There were 40 acres of uh, cotton that were being harvested there, and there was one single cabin. And so he uh, went and met the family that was living in the cabin. He brought leaders from the ministry that he began. He gathered everybody together, and here's what he did. They sang a hymn, probably like the hymns we sang, songs we sang a moment ago. Um, he read a verse of scripture, and, um, and then he, um, uh, he had a prayer. And so that was known then as the dedicatory cabin. It's the dedication cabin. And uh, guess what? Uh, I, I, I'm saying that's the founding cabin, but you know it as the John Neely Bryan cabin. That's the cabin that was on the 40 acres that was uh, purchased for the Butler Orphans Home 135 years ago. You see, that founding cabin stands as a symbol of light. It's a symbol of hope. And for 135 years now, Butler has uh, served the lives of vulnerable children, orphans, widows, elders, uh, and their families. And uh, this cabin uh, is, uh, is that symbol of light. It shines hope into the lives of the people that, uh, that we want to serve. And so, um, what, uh, you know, what, what, what did Buckner do? As we think about that beginning cabin, you know, what, what did he do? Well, uh, he organized and uh, founded the first black high school in North Texas. Uh, he started the Dixon Negro Orphanage in Gilmer. He founded really more, orphan, more high schools and orphanages. He founded three high schools. He started theological education for women uh, in Dallas. He started five hospitals. And uh, one of them he helped to start was the Baylor Hospital, which you know it's very close to here. He also shaped the Texas child labor laws. Uh, he started the Dallas Humane Society, which by the way was intended to provide humane treatment for uh, animals and children. Uh, he also helped, uh, he could back, back in those days, uh, children of all races were used as laborers. And whenever they died, they took that one out and put another one to replace them. That's how we lived. And Father Butler said, oh, no, we, these are children. And so he shaped and influenced the law, started the, T the Dallas Humane Society. He also helped and knew Clara Barton, helped her start the Red Cross. They went together in 1900 to Galveston after the great hurricane to save and to rescue as many, many children as they could. You see, uh, you, uh, you know this cabin 
uh, as the founding cabin now. And this founding cabin was not only the uh, birthplace of the city, it was the birthmark of a ministry and a movement. During the post-Civil War era in Texas, there was social injustice, widespread poverty, hunger, child abandonment, slavery, starvation, neglect, the impact of racism, illiteracy, and tuberculosis. And Robert Cook Butner answered the call. He decided to do something about it. This cabin is a reminder of, uh, in difficult circumstances, in, 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 in negative, uh, difficult circumstances, what one person can do if he or she will just rise to the occasion. You know, he published a, a newspaper called The Good Samaritan. And in The Good Samaritan, he focused around three, theme, three themes, goodwill, good words, and good works. C can we say that together? Let's say it together. Ready? Goodwill, good words, good works. That's what Buckner did because he was J-shaped. He was shaped by the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. His heart, his worldview, his actions were shaped by Jesus. Dr. Rodney Stark uh, wrote the book, The Cities of God, How Christianity Became an Urban Movement. And I want to quote one line from that book. He said, the true revolutionary aspect of Christianity uh, lay in the moral imperatives such as love your neighbor as do unto others as you would have them do unto. It is more blessed to give than to. When you do it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto. You know this. These weren't slogans. These were actual actions that the first century community did. Uh, you see, they did them, uh, they, they did them uh, in serving the poor and uh, serving the orphans and the widows and uh, healing the sick. Uh, they did it as a response to the long-standing misery of life in antiquity over against the inability of the pagan society to meet the challenge. That's what attracted people to Christianity was that no one cared. People suffered and died, and who cares? It was the Christian community that stepped up and did something about it. As far back as the first century, the Christian community has always had a sustainable answer it was the Jesus way. You see, the Jesus way gives life. The Jesus way shines hope. The Jesus way takes what was intended for harm and turns it into good. The Jesus way redeems life to its full potential. The Jesus way is the way that says, let the children come to me so they might be blessed. Dr. Tom Wolf, a friend of mine, uh, travels all around the world. He's in a station, or he's in Delhi now in India. And he says, you know, I've been all around the world, and it seems like just, you know, let's not talk theological and intellectual and academic and way up in the stratosphere about philosophy. Let's just kind of let, say it's simple. He says, here's my observation. And, you know, he works with different worldviews, and he's with people of different religions and different uh, perspectives. He says, you know, it seems like wherever I go on the planet, the closer I get to Jesus, the better things tend to be. And the farther I get away from Jesus, the worse things tend to get. That's his thesis. And he says, you know, um, everywhere around the world, in every society, every culture, every worldview, every place I go, if I see something good going on, he says, I notice that the fingerprints, the footprints, and the fragrance of Jesus is not far. It just doesn't happen. It happens because it's the Jesus way that brings hope to a society. And we have Jesus in us. We are Jesus-shaped. The challenge is not Jesus. Because, you know, he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He has the same power to transform lives today. He has the same power for uh, redemption of lives today. He's the same for Dallas today. He's still on the throne. He's still high and lifted up. He's still available. He's still in you. He's here in us and for us. So the problem is not Jesus. What's the problem? Maybe the problem is us. Maybe the problem is with Jesus' followers. Maybe it's time to repent, and maybe it's time for us to join hands with each other for goodwill. Maybe it's time for us to speak good words. Maybe it's time for us to do good works. 
Maybe it's time to go back in order that we can go forward. Maybe it's time for you and for me to go to the founding cabin. Maybe we should go there to Pioneer Plaza. Maybe we should get on our knees and maybe we should ask God to forgive us. Maybe we should repent uh, for uh, the lack of uh, engagement with our city. Maybe we should go there and ask for God's power. Maybe we should ask him for his favor. Maybe we should ask God there in the founding cabin, right there on Pioneer Plaza, God, we ask you for this city. Uh, maybe we should ask him. Maybe we should ask for this city. Stephen Um and Justin Buzzard wrote a book called Why Cities Matter. And uh, I love their description. They say, some of us have been living against the city, criticizing it and not helping it. Some of us live above the city, ignoring it, living our privatized lives. Some of us need to repent of living merely in the city and failing to uh, engage and offer solutions. They say, we are called to live for the city. So let me ask you a question. How are you living? Against, above, in, or for? Every movement of the Spirit of God on the planet since humanity began has started with repentance. We might as well start now. We might as well start right here. Would you join me? Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we stand here before you grateful to learn about the founding cabin, grateful to know that there was one person in the 19th century who was a part of a movement who didn't get concerned about how bad things are because they knew how great you, you were. Thank you, Lord, for a life that was shaped by Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you for a man who decided to do something rather than just talk about it. Thank you for someone who lived, Lord, not against the city, not above the city, not just in the city, but for the city. We pray, Lord, that you give us the courage and the energy, give us the passion, give us your Holy Spirit to guide us to live for this city, for the children, for the families, for seniors, for anyone, Lord, who is looking for hope. Show us and teach us to shine hope into their lives with real life solutions so that they might know there is a God in heaven and he has visited me. We pray this in the mighty name of the one who redeems everything, the one who takes what has been intended to harm and turns it into good, the one who is redeeming me, the one who is redeeming us. Do something, Lord, that people will have to say there's something going on in Dallas. The Spirit of God is here. We can see it. We can feel it. We pray this in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the one who comes again.